Yeah, so uh, we are in this age where in a lot of scientific fields, we're collecting lots and lots of data. And this data is so much that we really need computational methods to be able to efficiently process this data. So if you think about the data-driven scientific discovery paradigm, it fits into this broader picture. We collect big data sets. And with these data sets, we try to learn some kind of models, which allow us to do some sort of downstream inference for a task that we care about. Now, all forms of machine learning can be cast into this kind of framework. So if you think about supervised learning, we might be collecting a data set of images, and then we are trying to learn a model, which could be a classifier, which then allows us to make a prediction about the labels of each class. Our reinforcement learning also fits into this paradigm where the data we collect are the experiences with interacting with an environment. The model there is a model of how the world works. It's also a model of how the agent acts in the world. And the decisions we want to make are what kind of actions we need to take in this environment and get rewards, which guide the further collection of data process. Now, within this broad kind of paradigm of going from data to models to actually making decisions, we can see that there are a lot of challenges that come about when we start applying this paradigm to many other domains of interest for which data collection itself might be an expensive process. So in my research, I try to look at these challenges where collecting data is a bottleneck for training downstream models. Now this bottleneck could be because of many kind of costs that come about with collecting data. So these could be monetary costs, safety costs, or environmental concerns for trying to collect some of this data. And turns out that with a lot of these data that we collect, the black box methods that we have available to us might not work out of the box. So for images, natural images, for instance, we might have neural networks which work really well. But if you think about a lot of different scientific applications, trying to apply a black box method that's designed for another domain might not work for this particular domain. So the broader question that I try to answer in my research is how do we learn and reason with limited supervision to accelerate this pipeline in going from data to models to decisions? Now, within this broad theme, uh, I answer a lot of different questions, which can be cast into one of these four different subtopics. So on the probabilistic modeling side, I think about how we can acquire data efficiently and use that data to do unsupervised or weekly supervised learning. And I cast all of these kinds of different weekly supervised methods of learning into a relational framework, which allows us to see relationships across data points. Now, these technical frameworks do enable us to perform data-driven discovery more efficiently. And it's important to be able to ground them in real-world applications. So the applications that interest me are the ones that arise in physical sciences. In particular, I look at how these kinds of methods enable us to perform better modeling of climate, energy, and material sciences. So for this talk, uh, I'm going to simply focus on some of my most recent work that's going to be presented at NeurIPS later this year, as well as a preprint that we just released on trying to counter bias in general modeling. OK. so. Uh, generative models are at this particular stage where they're already transforming different avenues in science and society. So uh, a few months ago, you might have seen this doodle. So this was a doodle that was uh, there on the Google homepage. And it allowed you to create music alongside an AI-driven system, which was helping you harmonize the notes that you picked. So this essentially was an example of a generative model that's helping humans create music. It's also being used in applications such as dentistry. So now we find that generative models are being used to figure out crown fillings that could work well for uh, dentists. Uh, there are also applications, including some at Harvard, which look at how we can use uh, these models to better discover new molecules and materials. So these, a lot of applications are showing that generative models are really coming of age in going towards different spheres of society. As a researcher in generative models, though, when I train these models, what I get out of these models is not what often you see in these demos. So here's uh, an article which showed that if you trained 
a state-of-the-art generated models from different papers, and you zoom into the images, often you're going to see particular artifacts which look like checkerboard patterns. And these artifacts are not the ones that exist in true images. So really, the model has some imperfections, which are easy to detect if you really zoom in hard in this particular case. It's also true for language. Often when you learn a language model, you'll find that the generations don't look well, and you have to resample many, many times to get something that looks uh, good. Now, uh, so if you, this is uh, in the research community, this is always, almost always swept under the rug. So if I just search on Scholar about cherry picking with GANs, you'll find a bunch of articles which explicitly talk about this phenomena. In some cases, uh, they might be straightforward and say that the samples that they're using have been cherry picked. In other cases, they would want to take the higher ground and say that the samples are not cherry picked. And for majority of the papers, they might not be explicit about these. So all these are really examples to show that generative models, while transforming society, are also very much imperfect when we train them. So this talk is going to be taking a broader picture into thinking about why are these models imperfect and how we can mitigate these imperfections. OK. So I think of generative modeling as this particular problem. You have samples from a data distribution. So here are some samples from a distribution of, let's say, images of dogs. And our goal is to learn a model which can approximate the underlying data distribution. To do that, we'll think of a model family, M, and we'll try to pick parameters within this model family such that the distance between the data distribution and the best parameters in our model family is minimized. This particular objective uh, casts almost all of generative modeling and also shows what are the different imperfections that could arise in learning. So the first question we can ask is, how do we define a notion of comparing two probability distributions? Even if we have a good notion of comparing two probability distributions, choosing a model fam family itself is hard because it might so happen that the data distribution of interest might not even fall within our model family. If it does, optimization or searching within this model family for the best parameters itself could be much harder. And even if all goes well, we cannot get rid of the difficulty that we are always dealing with finite data sets. So what we have access to is the empirical data distribution. And if our data set is really small, this empirical data distribution p hat might be very far from the true data distribution p. OK, so all these in practice imply that when we train these models, we might not be able to recover the true data distributions. Or in other words, these generative models are biased with respect to p data. OK, now some of these challenges also occur in other fields of machine learning. So they're not exclusive to generative modeling. The challenge of optimization, the challenge of choosing a model family. What makes it particularly hard for generative models is that evaluating these models is particularly difficult. So there are three broad paradigms which are used to evaluate generative models. So the first one is from statistics, where we think of a general model as a density estimator. So you're learning a probability distribution. And you can see how well this probability distribution assigns uh, probability to points from a held out data set. But this way of evaluating general models is severely limited because it does not apply to models which have ill-defined likelihoods or intractable likelihoods. So if you think about VEs and GANs, so VEs, which represent one of the popular generative models in use today, they only approximate a lower bound to the marginal log likelihood. So you cannot tractably evaluate the likelihoods. The same with GANs. The GANs may not even have a, an approximation to the likelihood. Even more, there have been a lot of works which have shown that density estimation may not be correlated with sample quality. So the, essentially, we're trying to use these models to generate data. And the generation quality, in terms of perceptual metrics, or those that we care about any downstream task, 
may not correlate well with actual density estimates we get from these models. So to counter this, the second paradigm of evaluating these is proposed metrics which capture some perceptual notion of what it means to generate good data. For example, for images, a lot of these metrics, inception scores, FID, and KID, they're proposed which essentially define a way to compare moments of the two distributions, the data distribution and the model distribution, and you try to compare these moments in some feature space. So if, if the moments are close, we can conclude that the sample quality is better according to that metric. The final paradigm of evaluating these unsupervised models is to directly see how well they aid some downstream tasks for which we have well-defined metrics. So one of the most popular use cases of generative modeling is that it can aid semi-supervised learning, and you can see how well it performs on an accuracy metric with respect to the semi-supervised task. All right, so these are the prior works on how you can evaluate these models. In my talk, I'm gonna think about the bias in generative modeling with respect to some function of interest, okay? So we're gonna think of some function f, and in just a bit we'll see on what are different f's that we care about, which is gonna map the data that you either generate or you have from a data distribution to some scalar value in, our, in, in the real space. Okay, so this is some real valued function that we care about, and we'll assume that we don't know F during training, so this remains faithful to the paradigm of unsupervised learning, where we want to train a model using un only unlabeled data and test it on a variety of different Fs. So the evidence of bias mathematically is going to be when the expectation of this function F differs under the data distribution, the model distribution. So anytime we're trying to evaluate the expected value and we find it's different under the two distributions that we care about, then we're gonna say that this model is biased with respect to this particular f. Okay, so let's look at what are these different choices of functions f that we care about. So uh, one of the motivating use cases that we'll also see some empirical evaluation on is off-policy evaluation. So the setting is as follows. Suppose you collect some log data based on some policy. So let's say you, you're a doctor and you want to evaluate uh, how good is the treatment for some particular disease. And you conduct trials on patients, and then you find some, uh, you see their course of treatment, and then you have some estimate of how good that treatment is for that particular disease. Now, many years later, someone comes up to you with a different treatment. So that's a different policy. Now, that treatment is a new treatment. There is not enough evidence about how well it performs. So if you really want to try out that treatment, it might come with a lot of costs of like safety of your patients. So off-policy evaluation tries to offset that cost by using historical data from the treatments that you have already observed and see how well those historical treatments can guide the evaluation of a new policy. So in simulation, you will be trying to estimate how good a policy is. Now how this relates to generative modeling is that in a model-based approach, you will estimate a model of how the world works. So given some patient and some treatment course that you prescribe to that patient, what is going to be the next state of that patient? And then you'll try to see if that treatment leads to high rewards on average. So the way you compute these rewards is going to be an expectation under the dynamics model, which is a generative model of how the world works. So that's how these expectations under the model are useful, where f is now the reward function for your new policy. Another example in supervised learning is data augmentation. So in data augmentation, the idea is that you want to train a classifier, let's say, on a mixture of not just the real data set that you have, but also some augmented transformations of your original data set. So for images, you typically would rotate them, you would scale them, you would shift them, so you prescribe these manual transformations. And applying these transformations gen gets you more generated data, which you can combine with your real data set and then train a classifier. So this works well for a lot of domains in images and in NLP. And uh, 
One can also think of the question that, do we have to manually specify these transformations? Or can we use a model-based approach to automatically generate new data, which we can augment with our original data set? So in model-based data augmentation, you use a generative model to generate more data from the class that you care about, and then augment this generated data with the original data set to train a new classifier. So again, when you're going to be training this new classifier, now you're going to be computing an expectation of some classifier loss. So this is your new F now, with respect to the data that you generate from your model. So again, here's an example where you want to do Monte Carlo estimation of some function F with respect to the model that you learned. If I have time remaining, I'll also talk about how this process is also very much important, looking at the difference in expectations, if you want to be more sample efficient and yet fair with respect to some target distribution. OK, so let's go into how we actually try to solve this problem. So we said that we're going to say that the model is biased with respect to some unknown function f if the expectations under the data and the model distributions are different. So how do we correct for this bias? Now, the first option is, OK, maybe this bias is a consequence of the fact that the model family is really small. So we try to train deeper and deeper models. Now, while this might indeed decrease our estimation error, because we now have, sorry, this might decrease our approximation error, because now we have a bigger model family. So we can approximate the data distribution much better. This runs into the problem that it might increase our estimation error because now trying to optimize within this model family becomes harder because it's much bigger and we don't have good optimization algorithms to search within this model family. Even more, this does not correct for some distributional assumptions. For instance, let's say your two data distribution was a mixture of two Gaussians. And the model family that you picked was a single Gaussian, and then you're trying to use, let's say, neural networks to estimate the mean and variance of that single Gaussian. Regardless of how deep your neural network is, at the end of the day, the model that you're estimating is a unimodal Gaussian, which is not going to be fitting the overall data distribution, which is a mixture of two Gaussians. So there is going to be some model mismatch that might occur even with very, very deep neural networks because of distribution assumptions being mismatched. The second option, which is what we're going to look at in this work, is to think of bias as an instance of covariate shift. So the fact that these expectations are different is because the two distributions are different. And this is a problem that's very well addressed in the literature on covariate shift, which looks at paradigms like transfer learning. And one important technique from that literature that we're going to use is importance weighting. So the idea behind importance weighting is simple. It says that you draw samples from your distribution p theta to evaluate this expectation. But instead of doing a uniform sample average, as you would do in Monte Carlo estimation, you do a weighted sample average, where the weights are going to be given by the ratio of densities assigned by p data and p theta. So essentially, now what we're trying to do is trying to estimate this particular expression which is a weighted sample average. And if we had estimated these weights perfectly, this is exactly going to be equal to the expectation of that function f under the data distribution. So this is the main idea behind importance weighting. But what is the challenge of using importance weighting in the setup? We don't know p data. We only have a sample from it. In fact, we just discussed that for many models, even p theta itself is probably not known. For VAEs, GANs, these kinds of models, we don't even know the model likelihoods which are required for estimating these weights. So how do we get rid of this difficulty? So our procedure is to use a classifier to estimate the importance weights. So this is how it works. So we're going to be training a classifier on a, on a task that we create. The task that we'll create is that one of binary classification. Where we look at our real data, this is the same data that was used to train our generative model. We'll assign it the label y equals 1, so it's a positive class. And we look at the data that you sample from our model, 
and we'll assign it the label y equals zero. Okay, so we use this kind of setup, and then we train a binary classifier to estimate these weights, which means that we will learn a classifier which tries to distinguish data points as belonging to from that coming from the real model versus those coming from the general model. Now this procedure, why should we believe this procedure to help us in importance weighting? It so happens to be the case that if we were able to learn a Bayes optimal classifier, then the importance weights is nothing but the ratio of densities assigned by this classifier to be from the true class in the numerator. So this is the probability that the classifier thinks x is in the true class over the probability that the classifier thinks that x is in the fake class. Okay. Now in practice, we're not going to have a Bayes optimal classifier, but this can be used as an estimator. So we train our classifier and use the ratio of densities assigned by that classifier to estimate our importance weights. So to make sure that we get closer and closer to the Bayes optimal classifier, we want to make sure it has probabilistic semantics to it. So the loss that will be used to train this classifier will be a probabilistic classification loss. We want to make sure it's calibrated. So the probability estimates that it gives are meaningful. And we want to also ensure that it generalizes to a validation set. OK, now this might remind some of you of GAN training. So you have a generator. You train a discriminator to distinguish real and fake. So how is this different? Now I'm going to argue strongly that this is not the same as GAN training. We are here looking at a pre-trained model and then trying to do correct for its bias. So we are not doing any optimization of the general model. And for anyone who's worked with GANs, they know that optimizing the generative model parameters of a GAN is a nightmare. So this is really saying you train, you have a pre-trained model, and then you're training an additional classifier on this task. In fact, what I'm going to show in a few slides from now is that this induces a new generative model, which is not just a generator, but it's the generator and the classifier combined. So this is going to be one of the takeaways that you can boost your original model P theta with a classifier that's trying to estimate importance weights. So the resulting model is now a hybrid model. OK, so uh, here's how it works in practice. So let's say the data distribution is a mixture of two Gaussians your model is a single unimodal Gaussian. And here you see samples drawn from the model in green and samples drawn from the data distribution in blue. So clearly this model is not able to fit the data distribution. So we want to correct for its bias. So what we can do is we train a classifier on this task of distinguishing between the blue and green points. And then we can see how well this classifier does. So here I'm showing the probability assigned by the classifier to a point belonging to the positive class. So wherever there's a greatest mismatch between the data distribution being high and the model distribution being low, we see that the classifier reflects that kind of discrepancy. And for reference, we also have the Bayes optimal classifier, which we can compute if you don't look at the samples, but look at the actual function. So if we train with more and more data from our data distribution, we can actually get really, really close to the Bayes optimal classifier. So this is in a toy setting how this works. Okay, so the rest of this talk is now going to show how this importance weighting, which is likelihood free, all it needs is samples from the data distribution and the model distribution, no likelihoods at all, will actually lead to a debiased evaluation and how this procedure is actually inducing a new resample general model. So that's the second part that we're going to show. OK, so let's start with how this helps us do model-based Monte Carlo evaluation. OK, so let's say for some of the tasks that we talked about, whether it was data augmentation, whether it was off-policy evaluation, we are interested in computing an expectation of f with respect to p data, but using only the model p theta. So using a model-based Monte Carlo estimate of that expectation, that's our goal. So if we did the default estimation where we do not do any bias correction, 
we're going to draw t samples from p theta and do a sample average of these uh, function evaluated at these samples. If we did the importance varying procedure, what we're going to do is we'll draw samples from p theta as before, but then we'll do a weighted sample average. So in practice, actually, what can happen is these weights can have a high relative variance, so they can be really, really small. So the relative variance can be really high. So what we do here is actually, in practice, we use a self-normalized version, wherein every weight that appears in this sample average is normalized by the sum of the weights across the t samples. <coughs> so self-normalization uh, is the estimator that we're actually going to use in practice. OK, so how well does this procedure do on high dimensional settings. So um, here is uh, uh, FIFA 10 is one of the benchmark data sets for image generated models. And here, uh, there are different ways to evaluate sample quality. So inception scores, FID, and KID, there are three different scores that try to see the perceptual quality of these samples. And inception scores <laughs> is high, and FID and KID should be low. So higher inception scores are better, and lower values for the other two metrics are better. So the first thing we do is we try to estimate a reference score. So this is like, if our generative model was actually the data distribution, how well would it do on these metrics? So that's the first row that we see here. So these reference scores are drawing samples from a held out set and doing a sample average for these different choices of S. So we see some numbers. Now, if you're evaluating our generative model, we can do two kinds of evaluation. So fixed UCN and plus plus is a state-of-the-art likelihood-based model. And if we do a default evaluation of these models where we simply draw samples and do a uniform sample average, we observe some metrics. So we see that the inception scores are half of the reference scores. Uh, the FID and KID are orders of magnitude worse than the reference scores. But interestingly, if we do a weighted debiased evaluation, we get a better approximation of what the reference scores could have been with these models. So really, this is showing that doing likelihood pre-importance fading can help you do a more debiased evaluation. This is not unique to just likelihood-based models. Our approach is black box. It can work with any generative model that allows you sampling. So we tried this with the state-of-the-art GAN model, Hessen GAN. And even in this setting, we see that for all the different metrics, we can improve on these reference scores. OK, so this is some unsupervised sample quality evaluation of these models, uh, the state-of-the-art likelihood model, the state-of-the-art likelihood-free GAN model. And in both cases, we see that we can improve in doing a more debiased evaluation. The other thing I promised here was that this way of training a classifier to correct the bias is actually inducing a new generative model. And let's see how this happens. So the new generative model is going to be an unnormalized model that's going to be the product of two experts. The first expert is our base generative model, p theta itself. So we're going to think of it as being one contributor to this new density. The second contribution is going to come about from this weighting function that we learned. So now the weighting function is positive. The p theta is positive. So the product is going to be positive. So that's all that's needed to define an unnormalized model. But what's also important is to be able to estimate the partition function for this model, which is the expectation of these weights with respect to p theta. Now this, in general, could be intractable. And so trying to do exact density estimation and sampling with this new induced model is going to be intractable. What we can instead do is a particle-based approximation to this induced density. So this is best understood with an example. So now what this particle-based approximation does is it tries to approximate p theta phi, the induced distribution, with a finite set of particles. So we're going to call that as k. So you choose a finite, in some integer, positive integer, k. So let's say we chose picked uh, k equals 3. So how this procedure works is that you draw 
k or three samples from your base model p theta. So we draw we drew three samples from the general model. This was trained on CIFAR. So you can probably recognize objects here on the right and on the left, but not in the center. And for each of these samples, we estimate the importance weights. So you can see the importance weights being high for recognizable samples and low otherwise. So with this kind of particle-based approximation, so we have three samples or three particles which are approximating the induced distribution, we can efficiently sample. How we do that is we define a categorical distribution that's proportional to these weights. So this categorical distribution is actually very easy to estimate because we chose a finite sampling budget, k. So computing this categorical distribution is simply normalizing these weights by the sum of all the weights in our mini batch. So if we normalize these importance weights, we get these numbers. And then to draw a sample from this distribution, we will simply sample an index that's proportional to these uh, the, the probability parameters and return that sample index. So essentially, what this procedure is doing, it's approximating the induced generative model with weighted samples. So we have weighted each of our samples, and the weights are actually, if our estimator W is good, these weights are going to upweight the samples, which look more like the ones that come from the data distribution. Okay, so a theoretical question to ask is, are we always guaranteed to do better? And the answer is no. So here's a simple counterexample. Let's say someone gave me the Bayes optimal classifier, but with one difference. Whatever the Bayes optimal classifier estimated as my importance weight or my probability, I flip that probability. So if the Bayes optimal classifier predicts a probability P, I give return one minus P. Now this is something we do not expect that will work in practice because you can, for all the good samples that come from our base model P theta, we're going to be downweighting them. For all the bad samples, we're going to be upweighting them. So this is a simple counterexample to show that intuitively we don't expect this procedure to always work. So the question to ask is, when is this guaranteed to work better? So in other words, we're asking, when is this induced model P theta phi a better fit to the base model P theta. So better here needs to be quantified. So the way we are going to quantify is we're going to say a model is better if it reduces the KL divergence with respect to P theta. So P theta phi is a better model than P theta if the KL divergence with respect to P theta gets reduced. So to get a condition under which this holds, uh, we have a necessary and sufficient condition, which essentially says that the expected log weights under the data distribution, if they exceed the log partition function, then we are guaranteed to do better. Now there's a bit of technical detail into uh, understanding this particular equation, but one thing we can observe here is that let's, if we have to empirically verify this in practice, so if somebody gives you a classifier W, you want to see whether it's going to improve your model fit. The left-hand side, you can estimate it via Monte Carlo. So you draw samples from your data distribution, and then you do a sample average of the log weights. For the right-hand side, it's hard because a Monte Carlo estimate of Z will actually lead to a bias estimator for log Z. So the RHS, it's hard to estimate in an unbiased manner. So what we can instead do is derive some weaker conditions which are necessary or insufficient, but they can be easily checked in practice. So these are two necessary conditions we have which check for the expected log weights and the weights under the data distribution, the model distribution. And if these conditions are satisfied, one can hope that any importance weight estimator W will actually improve your model fit. So these conditions are essentially going to the heart of what it means to boost a base model P theta with an importance weight estimator W. Okay, so we motivated the discussion around bias with two applications. So let's look at how well 
this kind of procedure actually does on these two applications. So the first application that we looked, we were talking about was data augmentation. So recall that the goal here is to augment our training data set with generations, which are transformations of your original example uh, that look similar to the ones that you saw in your training data set. And the hope is that by training a classifier on a mixture of these real and generated examples, you can improve your classification accuracy. So we looked at the Omniglot data set. Now this data set is particularly challenging for data augmentation because it has more than a thousand classes. So you're really doing a really large scale multi-class classification. But every class has only 20 examples. So you're limited in the supervision you provide for every class. So there's hope that trying to do these transformations can actually improve your accuracy. So how does this work with generative modeling? You train a conditional generative model on Omniglot where you condition on the class ID. So you, there are 1,000 plus classes. You condition one of the class IDs. And then you try to generate more examples from that particular class. So this gives you an augmented data set, which you can append to your original data set for that class and hope that your model does better. So let's first look at qualitatively how this importance varying procedure helps. And then we look at some quantitative results. OK, so Omniglot is a data set of handwritten characters from different alphabets. And here I'm showing three classes, which denote three different characters from different alphabets. And for each of these classes, I'm showing two rows. The first row is showing five samples from the real data set. So for class number three here, these are the five examples. These are just sampled from the real data set. In the second row for each of these classes, I'm showing generated examples. And these are examples that the model has learned to generate. And uh, some of these are really good. So this looks like something that could have come from this class, but others not so. So what I've done here is I've sorted these examples as per their importance weights. So the, it's in descending order. So the one that you see on the extreme left has the highest importance weight, and then it reduces as you go to the right. And you can see some anomalous cases. For instance, these examples are unlikely to help the downstream augmented classifier. In fact, most likely they're going to hurt the classifier and confuse uh, the decision boundaries that it learns. So by importance weighting, you're able to push them towards the end. So when you train your augmented classifier, they would contribute less to your augmented loss. OK, so uh, how well this does in uh, practice in a quantitative fashion? So here we look at different ways to do uh, data augmentation. So the first three are simple baselines. So you can train on just the real data set, or you can train only on the augmented data set, or you can do likelihood free importance varying only on the augmented data set. And that will give you some accuracies. Now recall this is a more than 1,000 classes. So if you were just doing random prediction, you would get 1% accuracy. So the baseline that gets a 66% accuracy is actually doing very well. But to further the boundaries of what we can do with this data set, we can augment it with generated data. And we can do that in two ways. If we just concatenate all the generated data with the real data, we actually don't see much improvements in accuracy. So this is suggesting that the examples that you're adding are helping and hurting both. So on the net, effect is 0. However, if you importance weight the examples, as we saw in the previous slide, where the good examples are upweighted and the bad examples are downweighted, you do observe improvements in accuracy. OK, so this was uh, showing how likelihood free importance weighting can help in data augmentation. And now let's look at the second application in off-policy policy evaluation. So recall the setting here is that we have some log data that has been collected based on some previous policy. So a doctor could have tried out some treatments in the past, and she could have monitored the progress in the health uh, status of the patients over time. So that will give you some sequential log data. Now this log data, we can think of the generative process behind this log data. 
the very first state who the patient is could be sampled from some known distribution. So this could just be random. And every time we, the, we take an action, we do it as per the treatment that you have in mind. So this is going to be the policy phi b, also known as the behavioral policy, which tells you what action to take on a particular state of the patient. Based on the action you take, you'll observe some rewards. So those are going to be the rewards that you observe at every time step. So these could be the vital signs of the patients. And given the current state in action, the, you see a progression of a next state that emerges from a dynamics model of how the world works. So you'll see that this patient has goes to a new state, and that is going to be governed by some global dynamics model that we do not know. So this problem, we don't know phi b, the behavioral policy, and the transition dynamics exactly. All we assume is that we see log data. So we have really seen just samples of these trajectories. We don't know have a handle on what phi b and the dynamics model of the world works. Our policy evaluation is really asking the counterfactual, which is saying that if we had a different treatment out here that we wanted to estimate how well it will do in the wild, how can we estimate its value without actually performing that treatment because it might have some uh, safety concerns. So we have a target policy, it's also called the evaluation policy pi e, for which we want to estimate its value. How a model-based approach works is that it first tries to estimate uh, the world dynamics p via a general model p theta, and then it harps on the fact that p, th p the dynamics model, is global to the MDP. So regardless of the treatment you want to use this model for, whether it's treatment one, treatment two, or any other treatment you have, the dynamics model does not change. So using this model, then we can simulate how well the evaluation pi e would work in the real world. So this is the crux of model-based uh, policy evaluation. Once you have done the simulations, you can then just sum up the rewards that you see in these simulated trajectories, and that gives you an estimate of evaluation policy. Now again, we are trying to estimate a general model by p theta, so this model could be biased. So we can then train a classifier to debias this model. And now this classifier is going to look at triplets of state action next states that you see in your log data and the ones you simulate via your learned model. So this will then help us estimate how good a trajectory tau is as for the true distribution of trajectories versus the one that you estimate via p theta. So for every triplet of state action next state you observe in your simulated data, you can assign some important states. If you look at the product of these important states, that will tell you how good your trajectory is. So we apply this debiasing procedure where we upweight, downweight the simulated trajectories based on the important states um, on three high dimensional control tasks. So these are tasks from the Mojoko environment, and the goal is for these agents, a cheetah, a seam, or a humanoid to navigate in this world. And then we want to evaluate how well would these agents navigate if they were tried with a new policy that we don't, uh, we cannot simulate directly. If you simply did a model-based evaluation where we learned a dynamics model, and then we tried to do a Monte Carlo estimate of how good this policy is, we observe some mean absolute error, which gets significantly reduced if we try to upweight and downweight the trajectories as per their goodness that the classifier estimates. So again, this is an example which is showing how off-policy evaluation can be uh, done in a more debiased manner by doing an importance weighting on top of the general model. So to summarize this part of the talk, we said that General models, in spite of their multiple use cases in the real world, they are biased. And we showed how likelihood free importance fitting is, is helps mitigate this bias across a different wide variety of applications. So I want to end with a 
a food for thought, which is that bias is actually a necessary evil for generalization. So in this talk, I was showing places where bias actually hurts and trying to correct where it helps. But bias also helps you generalize when you have finite data sets. So if you don't have any bias with respect to your empirical data distribution, you're essentially just doing memorization. So you do want your model to have some good biases that helps it generalize to new settings. What we have shown is that by doing likelihood free importance pairing, there is a tool to control this bias. And that really helps makes it more powerful to apply it to many more wide variety of scenarios. So um, in the last five minutes, I want to do uh, a quick run through our latest work, uh, which we just released a preprint last week, where we extend this idea to the setting of doing fair general modeling. So um, this is the uh, way I see general modeling. You have samples from a data distribution, and then you're trying to approximate by a model and minimizing some distance between the data distribution and the model. So in the real world, often you actually have access to many more related data sets. So for instance, you could have data sets of cats or cows or sheep, which are related to your target distribution, but not quite the same. So the natural question to ask is like, how do we use these additional data sources coming from different data distributions to learn a target distribution for p-data? OK, so this can actually have very adverse consequences if done naively. So one of the most popular data sets used for benchmarking generated models is a data set of faces. So what we did here was we took two distributions. Uh, one distribution contained an equal number of examples of males and females. And the second distribution contained an imbalanced proportion. So these were two data sets that we looked at. And without looking at these labeled uh, information about the genders, we then tried to train a generative model on a mixture of these two data sets. So unsurprisingly, if we just combine these two data sets, which have one of which is imbalanced, when we generate new examples, we see that this bias propagates. So this orange line separates what have been identified as females and uh, the ones below are males, and you see that there is an imbalance in the generations. So even though this procedure is sample efficient because it looks at both the data sources, the bias unsurprisingly propagates if you do a naive combination. Instead, if you did a debiased approach where you importance weight every example from your auxiliary data set, you can learn a fair general model. So what we did here was we learned a classifier, again, now to distinguish between samples from the two data sets. And we looked at the importance weight it assigns. So the importance weight it assigns to the underrepresented subgroup are more than the importance weight it assigns to the overrepresented subgroup in this data set. So it's going to be really upweighting the contributions to the loss that come from the underrepresented subgroup and uh, downweighting the contributions to the loss coming from the overrepresented subgroup. What's interesting is this importance weight classifier was learned in a completely unsupervised manner. It did not need any label information of the subgroups from each of the two data sets. And once we train this kind of classifier and then apply it to learn a general model, we do see some balanced generation. So again, the orange line separates what have been identified as females versus males, and we do see a clear separation which is balanced on both sides. So really, this approach allows you to mitigate even the data set bias in this case while being more sample efficient. And quantitatively, we see the same kind of results where we are seeing the fairness discrepancy. So this is the difference in the proportion of male versus female generations. And if we compare it with other naive approaches, like equally weighting the samples or using different kinds of conditional general models, uh, we do much better for <laughs> different data set sizes. Uh, if you're interested, you can also look into our paper about how we actually derive guarantees under which this procedure of importance weighting will help you mitigate the bias due to latent factors like gender or race and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, many thanks to my collaborators on each of these two works. And I want to end this talk on a lighter note. 
So uh, I saw this uh, tweet on social media, which is asking this question whether an AI caption generator, so any AI system that's used to generate captions for images, would this AI caption generator think of this glass as half full or half empty? So let's do a quick poll. How many people think that an AI caption generator would think of this glass as half full? OK, so some optimists in the crowd. Uh, what about the, how many people think that the AI caption generator is going to be pessimist and think of this as half empty? Okay, one. <laughs> okay, so it turns out that uh, the AI caption generator is neutral. It doesn't think of this glass as half full or half empty, but really thinks of it as glass on a counter. So for now, these models are, uh, you can say they're neutral, but now as and when we train more and more generative models, on data sets like Reddit and whatnot, we should be aware of the kind of biases from these additional data set sources that could creep into our learned generative models. So uh, on the last slide, I just want to put a shameless plug that if you're interested in this kind of work, uh, my advisor and I, we started a new course on deep generative models. And we have been teaching it for the past two years. And a lot of the concepts that I talked about in today's talk, uh, we have course materials which might be of use to many of you. Uh, thanks for being a wonderful audience.